Howdy, everybody. For the next episode at Group By, Paul Andrew is going to be talking about how to be his Azure DBA or DSA, as he calls it. So take it away, Paul. Thank you. So what I like to do with, um, with a lot of my sessions is start by playing the Azure icon game. So this is just a this is a this is a primer to the main session, and um, it, it tends to work quite well when I'm at events, when I'm I'm face to face with people because they're sat in the audience and they can't cheat. I think as we're doing it on a webinar, or um, people could perhaps just go into the Azure portal and find out the answers. But I I think we should play anyway. And oh, yeah. uh, Brent, I'm expecting full marks here. Oh boy, this is going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I don't know, maybe if we should do like um, fastest finger first in Slack or something like that, maybe. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, um, I'll minimize the presenter view and um, I'll, so hopefully we can, I can keep an eye on Slack as we go through. So, so the Azure icon game. So a lot of my slides have got a lot of these icons in. So it, it did start off as a bit of fun, but um, I think it does actually help perhaps now people just maybe uh, learn what I'm talking about with some of my other content. So we'll, we'll start off with an easy one. This is an easy one, right? Oh boy. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> I, I, I think I know what that one is. We'll see if people in the Slack channel know it, or if you're yes. only in the go to webinar Q and a, you can put your answer in, in the questions too, as well. Yeah. Good point. No one's even typing. No, I don't think they even know. Okay. Oh, Melanie. Dear. Melanie and Q&A got it. It's the Azure platform overall, she says. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's an easy one. Good start. Hopefully another easy one. We've already talked about it. Oh, we've oh, yeah. certainly mentioned it. Let's see. You, I, I still, I don't even see people typing. This is how stumped they are. Oh, dear. Again, I think this is perhaps why this is the perfect audience for this talk. Brandon says a logic app. No, this is a virtual machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mm. this this is going to be an easy one. Microsoft have done some really great marketing with this one. I and didn't know it had little bands on it. Yes, Melanie says Cosmos DB. Yes, Melanie, good work. Melanie is two for three. How about this one? We're going to get a little bit harder now. So if we've got an as your tenant, we will certainly have this. Todd says an Active Directory. Yes, yes, as your Active Directory. Good. A lot of wrong answers in the Q&A, but yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is an easier one. Brent, what's that one? <laughs> I want to say that's Oracle. I believe that's the Microsoft hosted Oracle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. A little bit harder. The first place cloud. That's what that is. The whatever one is in the first place. <laughs> that um, one's the uh, Azure Advisor. Ooh, so, Tra Tran got it in Slack. Yeah, nice one. Okay, this is a, a nice intuitive one. I I think. Again, we've we've all got one of these. If you've got some Azure workspace Rubik's cube. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tran says event grid. Not event grids. This is actually just our resources. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, Todd at least got it. Todd said all resources over in go to webinar yeah. QA. Uh, I should open that window as well. Excellent. Okay, moving on. What's this one? I think I know this, but I'm not sure. Tran says virtual network. That's Daniel virtual says network. network yeah. Trans taking it home here. So we have the Azure SQL DB. What about this one? I think I know this one. We'll see if other people get it. Daniel says Elastic Data Pool or Elastic Pool. Robert says Data Warehouse. Engineering Robert, SQL yes. says Containers. <laughs> SQL DW or SQL Data Warehouse. Okay, moving on. How about this one? Oh. Oh, I know this one. Is this the Internet of Things? Is this Internet no, of Things? Jeez. Uh, I think no everyone stumped on this one. Yeah, everyone went dead quiet. Oh, uh, Corey <laughs> says, my kid's attention span. <laughs> <laughs> this one's cognitive services. 
Oh, so the cloud is supposed to be a brain in that one. That's what that That's was. It. I think so, yeah. Oh, okay. How about this one? Sorry, the, the resolution on this one's not very good. See, now we've already talked about virtual machines, and I would have guessed that that was virtual machines because it looks like pizza boxes, but that's not <laughs> it. Uh, let's see how the attendees do. Tran is typing. Tran says a node. Not a node. Crash says, or Crash Dan says cash. Oh, yeah. Databricks. Yeah. Oh, well yeah. done. For, it does look so a bit like a Redis cache. So, yeah. Hmm. How about this one? A little bit more intuitive, I think, this one. Breaking Bad? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see, no one else is it. Oh, it's Gene yes. says Azure Machine Learning. ML, yes. They're waking up now, aren't they? Either they're looking at the portal or, or we're getting <laughs> You've hit the parts that Daniel uses, yeah, or that, uh, that Gene uses, yes. Yeah. How about this one? What the? Oh, yeah, trans... Tran says storage. Yes, storage. Oh. Good. Um, sticking with the storage theme, a folder with a lightning bolt. This is the file service thing, but I forget what it's called. Nope. nope. You can you can swim in it. It's probably a big hint. Oh, uh, why would you call? Why would that? So Tracy says cache. Uh, no, Tracy. Tom, Thomas says data lake. Data Lake, yes. Data Lake storage. What the, why um, did that, what the sense does that make? With, do you want to swim where there's electricity in the air? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> to accompany our Data Lake store, we might have this. Let's see what folks come up with. Crash Dan says pool, but that's not it. Let's see. Gene is typing again. G might, Gene might have it. Data Lake analytics? Yes, correct. Good. How about this one? Quite intuitive again, I think. Data, Data factory. factory, Daniel says. Good work, yep. Yeah. If we have a custom activity in our Data Factory, we might need this. Is the, the best hint I can give you. Attendees are quiet. Gene, web jobs, Gene says? Not a web job. Any other takers? Mm -hmm. Doesn't... Got a couple logging, logging. engineering, SQL says. No. This is the Azure batch service. So we will talk about this one in a bit as well. <laughs> Other materials. Okay, moving swiftly on. Serverless compute people. We've got some more lightning bolts going off here. Automation, yes, on the money. Okay, that was an easy one. Similarly with the lightning bolts. Couple of people typing. Function app. It is a function, yes, as your functions. Good work. I think this is quite a nice one. This one makes sense to me. As your baby monkey. <laughs> Logic apps, yeah, somebody in Q&A. How about this one? This is the, the platform as a service version of our SQL Server friend. The crowd goes, well, Robert Rice is typing, Tom's typing. Flash isn't good, somebody <laughs> says. Yes, I, I agree. Flash is dead. The iPhone killed that 10 years ago. Availability groups? Oh! Yeah. It's analysis services, that one. We're, we're nearly there. Up. I was going to say, I, I don't know what we're learning. <laughs> it's not good. We're not, we're not smart. Oh, this is this bowling. One. Bowling. So this is for our, uh, our real-time data. If we want an endpoint for our real-time data, we might send it to one of these. Oh, the crowd's silent on this one. There's not it even is, any yeah. typing going on. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the Azure Event Hub. Similarly for our events, this is quite hard. I don't know if anyone's using this one yet. This Daniel is the says, event grid. 
and move on from our real-time data and we might put it through this service. That's kind of a nice icon. I like that. Yeah. It's like a cog with a hairdo. <laughs> Stream Simple. analytics, yes. Good work. <laughs> Robert says cog comb over. <laughs> we could rename it to that, I think. This one, I think this is a tricky one that probably catches people out. That one is the data catalog. The uh, it's quite a nice, uh, quite a nice tool. That one. This one, this is certainly more important for us, I think, these days. <laughs> key store crash. Yeah, there. key store. Yeah, key vaults key is, is is that's the name. We'll we'll take that. Um, okay, last one, the one that underpins all <laughs> of your services. Meat bags. <laughs> Let's see what We should happens. all know this. Uh, survey says we got a couple of people typing. Oh, nope, they backspaced out. Coffee, Daniel says. Yeah, okay, caffeine, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you for playing the Azure Icon game. You, you win absolutely nothing. If, if you'd like to play along at home, I do recommend um, getting the stencils for Visio, which I say wow. is probably when we're architecting solutions, I spend a lot of my time scrolling through there trying to find the right icon. Wow. So, so yeah, do go and get that and, uh, and you too can play along at home. Wow. Good. So hopefully we're now all warmed up. Brent, are you feeling warmed up? I am, I am, yes, yes. Okay. We'll uh, we'll get into the meat of. Uh... I feel completely incompetent. <laughs> oh, this is just a I think just to help as a primer. Okay, so my main session then be my Azure DBA or, or DSA. So this was um, I think an abstract and a talk that I put together uh, about a year ago now, and it was very much uh, just a cry for help. So as as I've already said. Um, I spend a lot of time working with the Azure services and doing things and, and my role has very much changed now to be a, a BI dev if you like, but in Azure and there's there's lots of problems um, that we that we face with some of these services and, and I basically just needed some help with them and when you, you're living kind of on this ragged edge of development, all too often I will search for an answer um, using our, our favorite tool Google and I'll get no results. So this it say it was it was really just a cry for help about a year ago now when um, when I had certain issues that I just wanted oh there must be somebody out there that you know is is now going to be moving into this Azure space a bit like I am and they could probably help me out. So I, I was thinking along the lines of a DBA type function but I say for me my job has, has changed very much as a BI person from the SQL Server stack to now this this is your platform of services. And for me, say that this, this DBA role, this on-premises DBA that's been working with SQL Server, for me, I, I think there's a, a gap here now where I need somebody's support. So this was where this talk came about. And hopefully I'm not going to offend anybody here by by making bold statements about what people's jobs are or what people's jobs should be, but really just a, a bit of thought provoking. So we'll we'll go through some of these scenarios and we'll see how we feel about it. So if you want the slide deck that I'm about to show you, please feel free to go and grab it. I've got a community events repository on my GitHub, Mr. Paul Andrew, which is the same as my Twitter handle. So. Um, please go and grab it from the group by folder on there. Just a, a quick disclaimer, uh, it's something that I tend to put up when I've got an international audience. Just a, you've got a blunt Englishman here with a with a dry sense of humor. So again, um, please don't take things too literally. Well, uh, that's my quick disclaimer. So our agenda and how perhaps I wanna break this down and, and help hopefully how I can relay some of these concerns and issues to you. Well, I'll hopefully just set the scene with a bit of context and Brent's giving me some great uh, primer content for leading into this. And then I'll actually talk about some real world scenarios and where I actually face issues that I, I really want somebody to help me with. So 
we'll look at that and then we'll perhaps just draw a few conclusions. So first up then, and I say let's you know just take a, a step back in time. And for me, uh, I think we need to look at our IT industry and look at the people that are actually working in it and particularly those people's roles. So once upon a time when, when I was at school, there was a, a single person in the IT department, this, this IT manager, it was just one guy and, and that one guy knew everything that he needed to do to, to manage the network and this was all good. You know, and, and as then technology advanced and, and things became more involved, we sort of broke that out and, and this person kind of got diluted maybe. Forgive the, the stereotype, uh, these avatars, they, they do also come from the, the Microsoft uh, stencil pack as well, so you can, you can get them and have some fun with them. So then, you know, we, things kind of progressed and these roles kind of diluted a bit more and, and people got a little bit more specialized in what they're doing. And, you know, this was great because this stuff gets more and more advanced. And that's certainly true of the tech that we're using now. And, you know, maybe if we, we skip forward a little bit, this is, for me, this is kind of like current day, if you like, on the right hand side here. So these roles have now been diluted and, and specialized now to the point where we've got teams of people working on some of this stuff. And that, that's absolutely the case. We, we need this because it's, we've got some very advanced technology out there. And as, as we know, nobody can be an expert in everything. So for me, present day over on the right hand side, and as we're present day in here, we've we've got me. So I didn't want to put myself at the, the front of this uh, team, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the second one back because I'm not that brave. So so here's me in, in this current world, um, this current situation, and let's let's kind of do something a little bit scary and, and let's let's look inside my head which uh, says, I promise you, it's, uh, this is a family friendly show, but <laughs> if, we, if we look inside my head once upon a time, when we talk about an on-premises solution as, as a data analytics person, we pretty much had SQL Server. You know, this was our friend that we, we know and love. It's very much now, uh, for me, a mature technology. We've had, you know, 10 years or so now of, of this product just getting better and better. And, Within it, we've we've got a, a whole bunch of services, which obviously the, this is this is certainly growing now. I, I've perhaps just put the the main ones up for me, but inside my head, as, as I say, we've got these services and how I need to apply them in in my day to day life. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bravely um, say that on the the vertical here, we've got my knowledge depth in some of these services and. Here's my, here's my crude line of my knowledge depth, I think, on these services once upon a time. And that's, that's where we were, and, and that was great. So sticking with that idea, there's, there's obviously some gaps there. I, I, you know, I don't have ultimate knowledge depth on, on all of these services, so I, I need somebody's help. So, you know, along comes my, my admin team, if you like, or, or my DBA. And, you know, I, I don't get me wrong, I, I, I love those DBAs. So <laughs> let's, let's do something even scarier now, and let's perhaps look inside the head of a DBA. So <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've picked a, a, a beardy DBA, a good friend of mine. So we're, if we're inside that DBA's head, and maybe we're kind of like overlaying the DBA's knowledge now with my own, maybe something like this squiffy line. I, I haven't actually uh, clarified this with my uh, subject matter expert, but uh, hopefully he, he wouldn't disagree with me. And, you know, be it between us with, with our SQL Server product, we can pretty much cover most of the challenges that we're gonna face. So where I've got gaps in my knowledge, that will be perhaps picked up by the DBA and, you know, vice versa. We can help each other out here and, and that's great. So that's that's very much a, an on-prem situation. Now, if we kind of move forward in time and we start talking about cloud services and you know maybe a, a BI platform as a service solution that we're going to deliver for a customer, we're going to do that with Azure. Now we've all played the icon game here, so <laughs> let's just bring you know a, just a, a handful of those up. And if I now, if I bring on the, the same sort of squiffy line 
it's going to be something a bit like this. Now, for me, this is this is a massive problem because where we can have a, you know a, a certain depth of knowledge in a particular service, now we can't just have a good depth of knowledge in say one or two one or two of these services. That knowledge we've now had to massively expand it where we have to have a huge breadth of knowledge on a, a whole bunch of other stuff you know and then this really sort of makes my head hurt i i did um play around when i was creating this slide whether it's how modest to be with how far i, I bring this line down or not with mm -hmm. the depth of knowledge but I'll, I'll i'll comfortably go with that for some of these um and you know if i if I want backup with some of this, if I get stuck, if I've got a problem, if, if some, I want somebody's help, you know, do I call to this administration team? Are they going to be there for me when I've got issues here? I, I think at the moment, for me, the, the answer is perhaps no. But, you know, that's, that's not to say this can't change. Um, again, just to sort of frame it and just to summarise, it's, it's no longer about the, the depth of knowledge which you hold, for me, with a particular product. We've now got to, say, have this breadth of knowledge on, on all of these services. You know, particularly if we, we're architecting and designing solutions here, we need to know what they're capable of. So, so yeah, this, is, this for me, is kind of frames the problem. Um, just to maybe perhaps elaborate on that as well, if we've got a hybrid solution that's using both Azure and SQL Server, you know, the problem becomes twofold. Um, maybe we've even got a SQL Server workload that's kind of running in an IaaS VM. So maybe we've got a bit of both. So it's as hard. And, and for me, ultimately, we, we end up a bit like this. Or, you know, certainly this is, this is how I feel, the, the brain exploding emoji. So I think it's time perhaps for a change. And I say this is where this session and this talk kind of came from. It, it was very much a, a, a call for help. So if we bring back our, our timeline and you know our IT manager and the, the way that things have perhaps progressed with roles in our industry, what I think we need to do now is, is take present day and maybe you know let's actually roll that forward let's let's see where this is actually going to go and this is you know this is pure speculation um please uh, feel free to put in slack if you think if paul's just talking rubbish I, I don't mind so what we actually perhaps need to do is let's let's dilute the the analytics team maybe that i'm working in now and yeah, maybe there's there's more depth here. We we need somebody to actually specialize maybe in, in you know distributed compute or you know a, a lambda architecture, a data processing that's gonna involve real time data as well. So I so say this is it's just speculation, but I think this is this is where we, we need to start heading and where there is there's certain verticals here where we actually need people to specialize more. Similarly, um, if we want to pick on the, the admin team. You know, uh, pure speculation, perhaps we need, say, like a, a cloud services admin that's going to help me out there or, you know, who knows, a, a federated user admin. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating, but for me, I say this, hopefully this, this frames the problem. Uh, are we all kind of comfortable with that before we move on and start looking at anything more real world? Oh, looks good. Looks good. Lots of people saying uh, they now that all of a sudden the icon game starts to sink in as you see how much your knowledge uh, suffers on different icons. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's only going to get worse, I promise. <laughs> so for me, that was very much the context and I say where this talk came from. Uh, hopefully you, you agree with me. Hopefully I've not offended anybody with uh, some of those uh, bold assumptions there. So if we now actually perhaps put that into context of, of a real world scenario so this is what we like to think of a, a data as the modern data warehouse so when we're talking to our customers this is very much you know a, a generic architecture of of things that we might need to use to deliver what it is we're, we're creating for them in in the data analytics space now Immediately, there's there's two icons missing from here, which is of course our, our Azure Active Directory and our Key Vault, two very important icons. But 
for me as a, a business intelligence person, you know, worrying about managing Active Directory and then perhaps keys isn't something that I'm naturally going to want to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So this is this is hopefully where we're heading now. So what I want to do is go through this architecture, just pick on a few services that are in here. And I say just talk a little bit more about some of the challenges that I face as a, a BI person and ultimately where I, you know, I, I feel my remit as a BI person ends and I ultimately want the help of more of a, an admin type person to, you know, have my back. So um, the first one we're going to start with is my favorite data factory. So I like data factory um, and what we'll do is maybe for, for people that are less familiar with some of this cloud tech, we'll, I'll just spend a, perhaps a, a slide talking about what these services actually are, just for people that don't know. So Data Factory is, is our orchestration service. We could loosely compare it to our SQL Server agents in the cloud if you like, but it, it does do a, a bit more. It will also perform copying of our data from A to B if we need it to as, as one function of it. The other function is that it's going to go away and call some other service to do the work for it. So it's our cloud orchestrator. And we can say to you know, go and do this, go and do this, go and do this. And it will receive those instructions as JSON. So hopefully I say this we, we could spend a lot more talking about data factory, but that, that'll do for, for the context of this talk. And maybe to help a little bit more as well, we've got some components in Data Factory that maybe we need to be aware of. So the first one is a link service. So this is very much how Data Factory is going to connect to something that we want to talk to. And this, if you like, we can perhaps compare it to our SSIS connection manager, maybe we're going to have a link service that stores our connection string, that stores our credentials. So bear that one in mind. We've got data sets that we have to define, which is kind of a, a metadata representation of where we're going to pull things to and from, whether it be a folder or a database table. Within Data Factory, we have something called an activity. So this is the, the piece of instructions which allows Data Factory to talk to another service and it says hey i want you to go and do this for me in essence and lastly we we have this idea in data factory of pipelines so we can group our activities together into logical things where we can stop and start them control them you know we can schedule those pipelines and we can trigger them so just four components for data factory hopefully i say just to give you a little bit of background if you've not used the service yet the other thing to note about Data Factory is it has these things called integration runtimes. So there's three versions of these, and these are, if you like, the bits of compute that allow Data Factory to do the work that you've asked of it. And the first one of these is an Azure integration runtime. So this handles things like our data movements and if we're asking some other service to do work for us. So it will use this Azure IR to carry out that instruction that we've given it. Next up is the SSIS integration runtime. So if we want to bring our SSIS packages into Azure, we'll need one of these to actually run that SSIS package on. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And lastly, we have this self-hosted integration runtime. So this is very much like a, a VPN gateway client that we can install on some Windows box and it will allow Data Factory to go and get um, content from SQL Server tables or file systems. Um, we can even use it um, with ODBC drivers and things like that if we need to. So three integration runtimes for Data Factory and, and four other components that we talked about. So Bearing in mind those things and, and what Data Factory does, what I then want to put to you is this idea of, or what, what I've come to see as administration considerations for this service. And, and this is certainly stuff which, again, I think goes perhaps beyond my remit and, 
certainly perhaps goes beyond my comfort zone for, for some of this stuff that we have to encounter day to day. So of course the first one which we've already touched on is Active Directory. We've got our service principles. When we deploy Data Factory, it will create a service principle for us that it is going to use to run under. We'll have maybe a, a key vault service because we need this to look after our link service credentials, our connection information. Next up, we might have this idea of an Azure batch service. Now, I've talked about this if we need Data Factory to run some custom code for us, if we want to use a custom activity. And if that's the case, we will use the Azure Batch Service to do that. That Azure Batch Service ultimately is perhaps going to talk to our Azure Key Vault. And the other thing that this Azure Batch Service will do, or, or what happens under the hood, is that we have a scale set of virtual machines. So within this batch service, we will define a compute pool. And that compute pool is, is just a, a set of VMs that we need to run our code. So, you know, straight away in this scenario, we've gone from working with a, what we thought was a contained platform as a service product. We've now had to extend it maybe because we need a custom activity. And straight away, we're into some sort of area of, of infrastructure, IaaS type services that maybe, you know, we, we no longer have the skills to manage ourselves. Um, this batch service with its scale set of VMs will perhaps have a VNet. Now, typically when somebody mentions a, a VNet to me in Azure, I, I, I pretty much run for the hills because of course with a, a VNet comes a, a whole bunch of stuff um, relating to, you know, routing tables and, and network security groups, subnets, firewalls, address spaces, DNS services, peering, service endpoints, and maybe an express route. Now, I, I just want to work with Data Factory. I'm, I'm a BI person. I, I just want to develop something that's going to support my, my ETL pipeline. I don't want to have to get into the realms of worrying about a VNet because I need a custom activity to clean my data. You know, I, I didn't sign up for that. But, but straight away, I'm, I'm kind of thrust into this area of, of IaaS where I, I absolutely accept I, I'm very much not comfortable there. And, and this problem kind of continues. So with our SSIS IR, our, our integration runtime, if we want to run our sys packages, we will need one of these. And similarly, under the hood, that will have a, a scale set of virtual machines, which again will also perhaps require a VNet. If we want them to, we want our SSIS package to talk to some on-premises SQL instance, maybe that's going to have to have a VNet and an express route. So outside my comfort zone again. Maybe we want to stop and start that SSIS integration runtime because it's expensive. So maybe we need to break out our Azure automation run books to to handle that for us. You know, maybe and that's going to have its own credentials and a run as account. And, you know, we're, we're executing PowerShell in the cloud. So that's got some implications there. I was just going to say there's an awful lot of white space on the left hand side. And I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Absolutely. So next up uh, on my hit list of considerations, we've got our hosted integration runtime. So as I mentioned, this is the gateway for Data Factory to talk to maybe an on-premises resource or, you know, we can we can use it in Azure as well. And that will perhaps require a VM. If it's in Azure, it's going to need a VNet again. So, you know, the, there's, there's problems here. I'm, I'm outside of my comfort zone again straight away. Maybe I want Data Factory to send some email alerts for me you know, some email alerts that I'm not going to get out of the box. I want something a little more detailed. So I, I can do this with an Azure function. But with that function, if I'm going to put some C Sharp in there that's using the SMTP client, I'm going to have to have maybe an Office 365 mailbox. You know, who's going to create that? Who's going to look after that for me? Moving around the, the clock, Activity logs and monitoring, you know, we, we obviously all want to monitor our services and 
we've got some stuff that Data Factory gives us out of the box in its monitoring portal, but maybe that's not enough detail. You know, maybe we need to create something more there, and maybe we want some operational dashboards that uh, that need to be looked that we need to create for people to look after them for us. Again, you know, considerations here that as a BI person, I, I don't want to have to worry about. Lastly, you'll be glad to know for Data Factory, the Azure integration runtime. Now, out of the box and by default, this will say to us that it's going to auto resolve the Azure region that it's going to run in. Now that's okay, but frankly, I don't trust it because this has got uh, an implication of when we're actually moving data around. Because if we don't want our data to go to an Azure region that you know we we don't um, we don't allow our data to be in, but maybe Data Factory isn't available in that region, we can have the orchestration service say in a US region, but we can say to it actually use the integration runtime in a European region or a German region or something like that, and this has an implication because we will then know that if the source of our data is in the region that we specify for the integration runtime, it's only going to move it round there, even if the orchestration service is in a different region. So again, this is a, an implication, and out of the box, it will just happen, and it'll say it's also resolved it, but maybe we want to be a little bit more explicit. And again, this is something that, that maybe somebody else would, would like to help me with. <laughs> so. Those are a few considerations there with, with Data Factory. Everybody happy with those? Yeah, Lee says, this admin considerations portion is why I quickly hit the eject button during my first playing around with cloud services. There was just so much uh, in, in work to do in order to get something usable going. Yeah, absolutely. And so many, I think, security considerations here as well, which is always a big one for me. Corey also says that he says just to point out, he says, aren't most companies thinking that when you go to the cloud, it's going to require less employees? It seems it sounds like you're saying that you're going to need more knowledge and more no employees when you go to the cloud. And this doesn't imagine what I thought was going to line up with uh, cloud sales pitches. Mm. I think for me, it's uh, it, I think the same amount of employees. It's just a, a change in role. You know the my role has evolved from on-prem BI to Azure BI, and I'm still one person. <laughs> I've gained a few pounds, but so <laughs> <laughs> I'm still one person. Um, my my role and my knowledge that I had has has just altered. I think the same is perhaps true for some of the considerations here. We'll move on then. So we'll come back to my architecture picture. And I've talked about Data Factory. So now let's look at the next one on my list, which is Data Lake, particularly the Data Lake storage. And we'll again, we'll do a little, a quick, what is Data Lake storage? So for us, this is, this is our landing area of all data. It's this bucket which can take petabytes of data out of the box and we will put everything in there, whether it be structured or semi-structured, unstructured. We don't, or we say we'll very rarely now produce a, a BI solution in Azure that doesn't have a data lake. We just need that landing area for all of our stuff to go into. And then we'll start manipulating it, transforming it once it's in the data lake. As the, the picture suggests, we can do that in a, a couple of different flavors. And there's some performance considerations there, depending on if you're putting structured data into it, how it's actually going to break it apart on that Hadoop file system underneath. So there's a, I've put a link in there for, for performance tuning if you want to understand how it, uh, it breaks apart your structured data. Um, but, but ultimately, it's this area where we land our data. And as you can tell from, from this slide, we will land it pretty much in the CSV form. CSV or, or Parquet just for, for performance. So that data lake then, let's, um, what we'll do is we'll break it apart. So we'll have a little bit of JSON and a little bit of PowerShell. And the first thing we'll do is we'll run that against our data lake store and create this subset of folders. So very much at the root level, we'll break it apart into raw, base enriched and created. And then 
subfolders for business area and source system and all that gives us is a, a very nicely structured data lake store that can then pretty much handle 90% of the stuff that we're going to do with it when we put our customer data into it. You know, we, we can think of this very much like um, a SQL Server database schema. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want a schema for people, a schema for sales, etc. Same idea, just in a, a folder structure in this data lake store. There's a, a great blog post from my colleague East on, on creating that structure if you need to. So hopefully that frames a, a little bit about data lake store. Now let's go back to the admin considerations then. What do we need to do to, to work with this service? So first one is the directory access. So all of those subfolders that we created, you know, we're going to have a whole bunch of users and services that want to read and write from them. So we need to take those service principles of those services and grant them read write and you know do we want them to inherit permissions they're the same sort of thing that we would have with a, a windows file system but now with this data lake store and of course that's going to involve azure active directory again so stuff that i don't particularly want to worry about next up is our encryption so data lake store will be encrypted by default um, at rest but maybe we want to have those encryption keys managed in our key vault. You know, maybe we don't want to let Data Lake Store manage them ourselves. We want to take care of that. So we might need the key vault service. Our Data Lake Store has its own firewall, which is actually turned off by default. So you might want to turn that on and have a, a you know a white list of external IPs that can actually talk to this service. So a consideration there. Pricing is obviously a big one when we're thinking about some of these Azure services now. And with Data Lake storage, we can actually pre-buy the storage at a monthly cost, which makes it a lot cheaper if you're putting lots of data in there. By default, it'll be on a pay-as-you-go tier. But at some point, I, you know, I want some friendly admin to look at my Data Lake store and say, hey, you know, you've got 10 terabytes in there let's start pre-buying this storage rather than having it pay as you go. It's pretty cheap anyway, but just a consideration. With generation two of this service, we are hopefully soon going to have available um, geo-redundancy as well. At the moment, there is no geo-redundancy with dates like store generation one. Um, if you want that, you're going to have to hand crank something that copies it to another Azure region. But with generation two, this is going to become an option. So if that's something that you need, um, it's a consideration there for which actually flavor of, of the storage you want to take. And then lastly, I think, you know, no surprises here. We perhaps want to monitor our service and, and maybe we need some Power BI dashboard or something to do that. So that's for me the, the admin considerations around Data Lake Store. Obviously, a few similarities with the position. Uh, permissions and things, but same problems and there's nobody to help me with this. Wow. So there's a lot of work. Uh, Hiram asks a slightly unrelated question. He says, if, is Cosmos DB a part of data lakes? No, Cosmos DB is, is very much a, a separate service. I, I would perhaps even go as far as to make the argument that for me, Cosmos DB is very much for your OLTP workloads and Data Lake Store is very much for your OLAP workloads. So two distinct services for, for different purposes is how I would perhaps answer that question. Perfect. So let's move on then. Let's come back to our, our architecture. So we've talked about Data Factory and Data Lake. Let's have a look now at Databricks. So I'd be very interested to know if anybody's using Databricks in, in production. So if you don't know what Databricks is, it's this analytics platform. It's, it's not a new platform. Um, it was created, oh, I've misordered my animations there. It's created by um, this chap, uh, Mathieu, in 2013. And it lives on top of the, oh, thank you for the poll. It lives on very much on top of this um, Apache Spark analytics ecosystem. So people perhaps have been using this for a while, 
um, and now it's been made available to us in Azure by Microsoft, which is all good. So much faster using uh, in-memory transformations rather than perhaps your slow I.O. transformations that we had maybe with Data Lake Analytics. And in the context of my modern data warehouse, we're very much talking about the, the batch processing that we can do with Databricks here. So I'm not, I'm not really touching on the, the streaming side of it or the machine learning elements of Databricks here, very much just the batch processing. So hopefully that's enough on, on what it is. Uh, I think Databricks has perhaps been around long enough for, for people to know. It's just, it's, it's kind of obviously new to Azure. So admin considerations then. So we've got our user management. I think I've totally failed on the animations here. <laughs> we've got, uh, I have totally failed on the animations. <laughs> We've got our, our user management, again, pretty much like we had before, which is going to need our Azure Active Directory. This time with Databricks, we perhaps want to think about what's actually going to be mounted in our Databricks file system. So if we've got our data in Data Lake Store, you know, are we going to make Data Lake Store available to Databricks? And which parts of Data Lake Store are we going to make available to it so we can start doing those transformations? Our jobs, you know, we, we've got job execution there that we perhaps need to monitor and manage. And maybe we need to actually look at how those jobs are going to be called, whether they're going to be orchestrated with Data Factory. You know, maybe they're, they're going to be done with a, a notebook that somebody's created, which is good. Or, you know, maybe we've got somebody using Java and we've got some extra Java libraries that are going to go into there. So again, just some management considerations that once we get beyond that transforming of the data, once, once this stuff is operationalized, we need to think about that. I've, I've put the dreaded VNet on here again because that is a consideration if you want Databricks joined to your VNet. The cluster management, so Databricks has to have a Spark cluster, you know, running for you to actually execute your code. Um, and it's quite nice, you know, we can have a, a cluster which is running all the time, we can stop and start it, or we can just say, you know, I want you to create a cluster for me whenever I submit a job. And we can define that cluster in terms of its control nodes and its work nodes, and, and that's all good. Um, but what actually happens behind the scenes in Azure is it will create a separate resource group for that. So you'll have a, a very oddly named resource group that perhaps appears in your Azure subscription when you've got a Databricks cluster. And because we kind of abstracted away from this service a little bit, that cluster will have a, a series of compute nodes that you define but behind the scenes, Microsoft just spin up virtual machines. And those virtual machines become the nodes of your Databricks cluster. Now, as um, I think Daniel said, when you do this, you will have a quota of cores that you can have for a virtual machine in Azure. Now, I'm you know, way off over to the right in my Databricks service, and I say, yeah, I want a cluster that's this big, I want you to auto scale to 10 nodes. Each of those nodes maybe has four cores. If you do that and that cluster auto scales, straight away, you're perhaps gonna hit the default CPU quota limit that you have in your Azure subscription, which, you know, it comes down to the CPU type and the region that you're running in. But, you know, I think it's fair to say it's an, it's an admin consideration there. Um, and I think the, the last one there is uh, just how we actually want to control access because we've got secrets and we've got secret scope management in Databricks. Uh, I think I did actually just include a, an extra slide there because maybe that's not immediately obvious to some people, but with Databricks, if you know we've got a dev test live environment, we can actually have one service to take care of all of that but we can have credentials that are scoped maybe just for the dev stuff or credentials scoped just for the test environment. And we can, we can say, just have this one service with different workspaces that are scoped for different things. So 
more considerations there, I think. Um, and again, I, I don't want to look after this. <laughs> so that's uh, that's my admin considerations for Databricks. This, uh, this feels like you're making a sales pitch really for someone to come in and be your Azure Services Administrator. Absolutely, absolutely. So what do we have next then? What should we look at next? Um, I think my, my next one on the hit list is our Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So quick one, what it is. For me, the, the best way to talk about what Azure SQL DW is, is if we start by thinking about our Azure SQL DB. With our SQL DB, we've got a single compute node and we've got a single block of storage. Now we can scale up these things. So explicitly saying scale up there, we can make the CPU more powerful. We can make the storage bigger. So that's our SQL DB. With our SQL DW, it's now distributed. So instead of a single block of storage, we have 60 distributions or 60 storage nodes, and we spread our data across those storage nodes. Similarly, we have um, not just one compute node, but we're in this diagram, we have four. We can scale out that compute. We can add more compute nodes to the service. And we'll have a, a control node that comes in and distributes that query. And those nodes then have an allocation of those storage distributions. And they will then do the work for us before bringing it back together. So hopefully that sets the scene for, for what our SQL DW is and, and why we might use it for certain workloads. And the nice thing is as well that the, the storage, very much like with our SQL DB, is disconnected from the compute. So it means we can scale it up without affecting the storage or we can scale out our SQL DW to more compute nodes if we need to. So then, admin considerations. What do we actually need to do here? Um, we know it's a SQL database of sorts, so we're probably a little bit more familiar with things that we might need to do in there with you know, tables and, and credentials. But because now we're in this sort of platform as a service environment, what else might we need to do with our SQL DW? Well, the first one, and, and perhaps the big one, which relates quite heavily to the cost is, we might want to stop and start the storage. So, uh, sorry, stop and start the compute. So disconnect that compute from the storage. So when we're not processing our data, we, you know, we don't want to be paying for it. So that's one consideration. Backups. At the moment for SQL DW, we just have the option to go in there and configure geo-redundant backups. And for me, it's a bit of a tick box exercise doing that one. But again, I think it's a consideration for some data services administrator that they, you know, they can go in there, they can look after that perhaps. Um, a good one is auditing and threat detection. So I think Microsoft, if you want to turn this on per server, Last time I checked, it was about £11 a month. And they will do the auditing for you and they'll do the threat detection with you know some of their fancy machine learning type services and AI will look after that for you. It's all well and good, you know, AI can do that, but um, we still need somebody to go and configure it. You know, we need to define a, a storage area. We need to work with that. Uh, I was just looking at the Slack channel there. Yes, we can pause SQL DW, not a SQL database. Trying to, to hopefully to answer your question. Um, moving around my spoke of considerations, I think the next one I've got is our firewall. So our SQL DW is going to sit in a logical SQL Server instance in Azure, and that's where we're going to have to go in and define our um, external IP addresses that we can actually use to get to it. So that's something that we'll have to sort out. And you know, if there's a, a, a white list of external addresses that we want to give to the, the server to access, uh, that we want to allow access to. Next up is our friend encryption. Of course, you know, we've talked about encryption with our, our data lake store, but, but similarly with our 
SQL type service. We do have um, transparent data encryption as well. And we do have the option to manage our keys, which is something that are gonna, is gonna perhaps be done by Key Vault. So something that, that might need to be done there. Moving around, we have the scaling of the service. So if we have a, a particularly high workload or something that's gonna take a lot of crunching, we might want to scale out our SQL DW, do that processing and then scale it back down. So it's something that, you know, somebody who's monitoring this service might spot, you know, they might see a CPU spike and they might say, okay, next time we run that load, let's scale up, uh, sorry, scale out the service and bring it back down. So somebody could do with looking after that. And of course, uh, our friend monitoring, we always need to monitor our, our SQL databases. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the sales pitch continues for, for where I need mm -hmm. this Azure data services type person to help me. Next up then in our architecture, I think we have our regular storage accounts. Now, this is a, again, I say a tier zero service. We, we all perhaps um, have one of these or we all need one of these. I, I know certainly I've got a lot of blob storage accounts that I will use where I'll, I'll dump class libraries and, and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, I, I, I'm an ignorant BI developer here. I just say, give me a blob storage account, put my stuff in it and that's it. But, but what other things do we need to consider? I'm kind of really telling myself at this point a little bit as well. So our, our access keys are our first one. You know, and, and maybe we want to recycle these access keys on a, a periodic basis. And if we recycle them, are we going to use our Azure Key Vault? Are we going to recycle that key, put it in our Key Vault, and, and then everything else that talks to Key Vault is happy? If we've maybe got some app services or websites or something, we've got this idea of shared access keys as well. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very much out of my comfort zone there, but I, I know these things exist and maybe we need to consider using them. Our VNets, again, it creeps in now. We, we have a lot more of these platforms and services that do actually have VNets and, and firewalls that we might need to consider and think about so setting up. Um, it came as a surprise to me that Azure Storage now actually has the ability to use Azure Search, so we can start applying indexes and things to our storage, which was, I say, it was a, a new one to me when I looked at this, but something there perhaps that needs setting up and configuring. Our friend encryption, it creeps in again here. Azure Storage, I, I forget if this is enabled out of the box or not, but we can encrypt it and we can manage those keys. We might want to set up some custom domain. If we know we're using our storage for something external, we've got maybe some website that's talking to it. We might want to actually have a um, custom domain that's put in here rather than it being just the, the usual sort of microsoft.storage.url that we get when we access it. Redundancy is a factor. So with something that is currently available, of course, with our, our storage accounts, we can say whether we want it zone redundant or geo redundant, those those things be, can be turned on with a little bit of configuration. You know, I'm not I'm not saying these things that we're talking about are hard to do. They're just considerations for when we use this service. Alerting is a factor. So, you know, what what if we've um, I, I think of it perhaps more if we've got something that's subscribing to the the storage account, maybe with event grid, we've got something that's going to be triggered or something that's going to happen if, if something changes in our storage. So alerting is in there as well. And I think perhaps my, my favorite one, which has now recently become available for our storage account, is this idea of soft deletes. So we actually now ultimately have a recycle bin for our storage account and we can turn this on and it will have um, a, a fixed period of, of days that you can retain the, you know, the, the copy of your data that you've soft deleted before it becomes a hard delete. So 
all, all great features, you know, it makes it a very versatile service, but lots of things to consider there if we're looking at administering it. Moving on, hopefully kind of getting the uh, getting the feel for my slides here, getting a getting a feel for the pattern that we're going to go through. Next, or I think perhaps next and, and finally on my list here, we have analysis services. So our SQL Server on-prem service now moved up into Azure in, in tabular form as an Azure platform as a service and product. But, you know, is it still the same? Well, let's see, shall we? Hopefully we, we know what it is because it's an established service. But when we come to consider what we might need to do with it, there's a few things that we've got on here. So we've got the stop and start functionality again. You know, do we want to have this service running all the time? Maybe during the night we want to turn it off or, you know, outside of office hours. So something that needs to happen to stop and start it. Typically, we'll we'll do this with um, Azure automation run books. Again, if we're perhaps orchestrating something, we'll have a run book with a, a web hook and some PowerShell. It will stop and start the analysis services model when we don't need it. Backups for analysis services. Now, I say this is this is really where I think things have evolved in Azure. Once upon a time, if we had the, the on-premises equivalent of analysis services, we would have to break out some XMLA or you know a SQL agent job to do our backups and do something with it. Now in Azure, we go into it, we tick a box and we say, yes, do some backups, put it in this storage account, and that's it, we're done. Now again, I, I still want somebody to help me do this, or I still want somebody to take care of it. And, somebody to say that maybe if we've got lots of Azure analysis services, we have a single storage account for all of them and somebody just to go and configure my backups all in that one place. Maybe we'll make that geo redundant as well, you know, who knows, whatever your requirements are. Like with our SQL databases, this analysis services product has its own firewall. And again, we'll maybe need to whitelist some external IP addresses to access it. I, I think if memory serves again, it's turned off by default. So you might want to turn that on if you haven't already. Replicas are a good one. So something that was very painful to configure if we had the, the on-premises um, cubes, we can now get pretty much you know, fairly easily in Azure we can have read-only replicas. I think up to seven of them last time I checked. So seven read-only replicas for our um, for our cube database. But if we've got a database that is dedicated for doing the processing and the loading, we then need somebody to go and say, okay, cube processing, processing has finished on the primary. Now go and sync that to all my read-only replicas. It's just something that needs to happen. Activity monitoring for SSAS. Now, again, this is something that's made very easy in Azure, but um, it still needs to happen. I think there was a there's a great demo of this on Channel Nine from Christian Wade. I think showed this using um, using log analytics within Azure. You know, something that was quite painful with extended events in a, an on-premises world, it's now made uh, a bit easier in Azure, but we still need somebody to go and look at that and, and somebody to enable it. I think the last one here with analysis services, like with our other services, is the scaling. Do we want this service to be scaled up when we're processing and scaled back down, you know, or somebody that's just going to monitor it and say, okay, you know, we've we've deployed some new models to our service. Maybe we want to consider scaling it up now. So something there to, to think about. So I think that's it for the modern data warehouse and sort of that, that block of, of knowledge that um, I wanted to pass on. And hopefully after setting the context and talking about that modern data warehouse in its generic form, 
we now perhaps have a, a better uh, understanding of where uh, I, me as a, a, BA, a BI person, I, I want some help with this stuff. Thomas asks an excellent related question. He says, looking at this chart at this point, what's my monthly Azure charge? This looks awesome, but expensive. Yeah, for um, for any particular service, Thomas? I think he meant the whole diagram, the whole modern data warehouse. Oh, uh, right, okay. So, 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 yeah, this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, somewhere between zero and 9,000. <laughs> It's uh, the, the consultant's answer, of course, it, it depends. This is very much just our, our generic modern data warehouse that you know we, we use in some of our marketing material, that sort of thing. And it's very much just a, a, a generic representation of all the moving parts that you might need in Azure to do business intelligence, shall we say. The, the depends is obviously gonna come down to you know, what your data is, where's it coming from, what transformations do we need to do to it? What presentation layers do you want from it? Um, there's even considerations here, you know, if, if there's Azure services that aren't actually available in every region, we might need a, a multi-region solution here. And if we're moving data from region to region, you've got egress charges to consider there as well. So the, the costing of, of something like this, it's, it's, uh, I think for me, uh, very much a dark art, but, but of course it's something that uh, customers will always ask, how much is this gonna cost? And I, I've got some, some monolithic spreadsheets that I will break out if I'm trying to estimate how much it's gonna cost a customer. You know, even things down to um, our data factory activities, there'll be a, a set price, I think for the first 50,000 data factory activities, uh, one cost and then beyond 50,000 it's going to be this and you know so when am I going to hit 50,000 activities you know is somebody going to tell me you know I've got to work out a very you know a, some sort of timeline so I can say to my customer yes in 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 four days time at nine o'clock based on our current workload you're going to go into the next pricing tier for your data factory activities you know, it, it really does take some some head scratching, I think, with the costing, certainly. So so I think I, I've dodged your question quite well there. <laughs> <laughs> Not answered it at all. Professional consultant, professional consultant. Yeah, I was just trying to be realistic. Um, the, the short answer is uh, how much is that going to cost? Who knows? <laughs> I, I think um, there's a, a great analogy as well that um, if somebody said you know the cost of an on-premises solution versus mm -hmm. an azure solution you say well when you buy a car you know how much that car is going to cost you up front you, you pay for the the complete thing very much like it maybe a sql server license you pay for it up front but if someone says okay i'm not going to buy a car i'm just going to get taxis i'm going to get ubers everywhere you know how how many journeys am i going to make how much is it going to cost you don't know because you know the car has been taken care of by somebody else you've just got to pay for the use it's a little bit like that with some of this stuff i think so um i think that's kind of just bringing me to the conclusions how are we doing for time brent so oh you got about five minutes left five minutes good stuff so really just wrapping up then so <laughs> i think the conclusion here and as you probably gathered um I think there is very much a, a role here that needs to evolve for you know some some great people out there to start supporting some of this cloud tech because as I say all my customers now they're they're using Azure for their BI solutions. I really really want a, a DBA type person to to have my back when it comes to looking after some of that other stuff. You know maybe not the infrastructure side of it, but Certainly some of that, you know, the, the backups, the keys, all that sort of thing. Um, and maybe to, to try and elaborate that with, um, with some very loose comparisons, if you like. But, you know, the, the task that was once an on-premises task, it has just evolved now into an Azure task. Maybe slightly differently, maybe we need to do something a little bit different, but things have evolved, my role has evolved, and I say I think there's some room here for, 
for other roles to evolve as well. So um, I think last up then, <laughs> Paul thinks that we need a, a DSA, a data services administrator. Do you agree? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of good discussion in uh, Slack. Uh, is that your last slide, or do you do you have more stuff? Uh, my last know? slide is. Thank you for listening. In that case, I'll fire away with the questions. Lee asks a really interesting one. He says, "How does the breadth of knowledge needed for the cloud mesh with people who spent years developing specialized skills as a DBA?" So say, for example, say you've got a lot of skills in high availability. It feels like I've spent years trying to become good with SQL Server, only now being forced into being a generalist. Yeah, great question. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I guess uh, ultimately all I can really do is extend my my empathy there. And, and you know, I, I felt the same way. You know, we, we we specialize in sys packages and performance tuning them and making sure we add our uh, buffers the right size and all the rest of it. Um, and and now, yeah, I, I'm forced into using all this cloud tech um, because that that's what's asked of me. Um, it's it's a hard one. I you know, it's it's a learning curve which in some cases feels pretty much vertical. So. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer for you. So all I can do really is extend my empathy. If you wanted to find people who would become your DSA, like when you're talking to people who are on your team or coming in from client uh, staff, what do you look for in people with skills that would make them a good DSA? Ooh, good question. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think um, oh, it's 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 somebody that's yeah, the, it's somebody that's got maybe a, a proven track record in administering something. Somebody that recognises the day-to-day -day requirements of services that are already out in the wild, and they know how to look after them. You know, somebody that's got that mindset that is willing to you know, what does this do? What does this do? Or what happens there if we if we change that? Somebody like that, that's got that mindset, that's not afraid, I guess, just to get stuck in and, and try it out is, is perhaps all I'd look for initially. Nice. Well, thanks for the talk today, Paul. Appreciate it. Very good. There's a lively discussion going on now over in Slack. Nice job. Mm -hmm.